Hello everyone, it's Takuya here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my hoes. Welcome back to the Christmas special that we were doing this year. And my God, guys, it has been a hell of a year with everything that we have been doing leading up to this point. It's actually crazy since, you know, we started the podcast, what, two years ago in December and here we are. It was two years ago in no- at the end of November. End so. of November, right. Yeah. It was like towards the end of this. But as you see, it's really crazy. It's been going on for as long as it has. And we are grateful to each and every single one of you who has been around here for this entire time with us. Thank you to all of our patrons. Thank you to all of us, or all of us, all of you all <laughs> who have been listening to the podcast for the past couple of years, new and old. Thank you all. But you know what? I thought that what we we're going to be doing here today is that I, I really struggled trying to find a topic for what it is that I wanted to do here because there are a lot of events that have happened on Christmas. Like I even contemplated going into this and telling the actual like, oh, yeah, uh, some of the like the story of the three wise men and everything going into this. I thought you were going to say Christmas truce and I'm like, everybody talks about the Christmas <laughs> I truce. Know. I know. Literally, like everyone I does. love it, but it's so overdone that I just skip it on everything now. It's true. For a lot of people, it's one of those things that you have the time-honored classics that are told time and time again. And so I figured, hey, wait, hold on. How did the classics become the classics? What do you mean by classics? Like Santa Baby, the classics? No, okay, that's music, right? But it's like, okay, when we're thinking of Christmas traditions, what do you think of? Like, what, what is a Christmas tradition? What is the standard thing that you see? Christmas trees. Christmas tree. Okay, that's a great one. Christmas lights. Lights, yep. Presents. Presents. Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Reindeer. Re- okay. Although. He was like, we have reindeer on our lawn. And he looks at them and he goes, they're just deer. I'm like, Stephen, why do we have Christmas deer? I didn't think that. Okay. He's like, well, I think they were just some deer. I'm like, Stephen. Because we're in Kentucky. Okay. They're reindeer. (laughs) We bought rain. (laughs) Decorative reindeer. But the way that the antlers are shaped and the way that it's set up genuinely made me think that it's like, oh, it's not reindeer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They're reindeer. Festive deer, I guess. That's what they're called now. (laughs) Yes, I guess so. So what I figured that I wanted to do here today is I wanted to dive into a bit of the history and story behind all these varying little Christmas traditions because there's a lot of big ones. Sugar cookies? Well, yeah, sugar cookies, of course. Yeah, but the big thing here, because sharing treats with people is common. But when you look at the stuff for Christmas, as you said, you think of Christmas trees, Christmas lights, Santa Claus presents. This is going to be like a very American take on traditions because where I'm from we have like parang and a whole bunch of different Christmassy things like fruitcake do not know why fruitcake is a Christmas tradition where I'm from but I contemplated putting that in here like I'm not I'm not even kidding I I contemplated putting that in here and then one of these things that I put in this for this list is eggnog which I personally hate eggnog I know you just gagged right now anybody likes eggnog I'm sorry that's a myth this is gonna be milk again I'm gonna be like oh eggnog's disgusting and everyone's gonna be like I'm sorry eggnog's amazing like okay put in the comments right now if you're watching this on YouTube how do you feel about (laughs) eggnog you know we that should be the poll for this one we'll make the poll for this episode is eggnog good yeah, let us know if you've had eggnog, if you hate eggnog, or if you like eggnog. And if you like eggnog, I need some like specific reasons as to how. Yeah. Not even why, just how. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to the story behind all these varying traditions and how they came to be in the first place. Because yes, ultimately, since we're in America and the majority of our audience is American, a lot of the traditions that I'm even pulling up here in the first place are American, so to speak but they have their origins elsewhere and much older than anything long before America even came to existence. And that's kind of what drove the curiosity. It's like where all this stuff kind of came from in the first place. Europe. But, um, <laughs> yes, a number of the things. And I'm telling you this right now, when we get to eggnog, oh, this one is going to surprise you. It took me by surprise. I did not anticipate that one at all. But anyway, getting this from the beginning, Christmas trees. All right. So when we're talking about Christmas, you're more than likely going to think of a Christmas tree and the records of using greenery in order to celebrate holidays. That is something that has been common for varying different holidays, for varying different faiths of, well, anywhere all around the world. Like trees and things are pretty common. And the idea of something of a Christmas tree is it's it's both older than we think of. And yet also simultaneously, it's much more recent because have you seen the people online that are constantly trying to say that, oh, Christmas trees are pagan? Yeah. Because it's like the association well, with Germanic paganism and all that going back in history. It's not even just people online, though. In Christianity, depending on what branch of it, they also are like, well, Christmas is a pagan tradition. Christmas trees are pagan. We're not celebrating Christmas this year because it's pagan, which is so funny because my family, which was deeply religious, 
my dad would do like an on and off Christmas where like one year we'll do Christmas and the other year they're like, oh yeah, but like we shouldn't do a Christmas tree because it's pagan and it's like. Depends on which way the religious mind turned at that point. Give me my damn tree. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Understandable. So th- that is both true and not true when it comes to varying things. The idea of Christmas trees being pagan, we have no actual proof of that. Like there, there are many different faiths, especially when it comes to like the old Germanic p- paganism, that kind of thing. That trees are sacred in yes and there's a number of different places like that but there are a variety of different myths that go and explain the origin behind the whole thing with christmas trees because when we are thinking of them it's actually a if for christmas trees it's an evil european thing like it is so one legend is an example says how martin luther who was the guy who kicked off the whole thing for the protestant like like revolution or not revolution Reformation. 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 You know, it was basically a revolution. Basically, it was a revolution, but he believed that pine trees represented the goodness of God. Uh, another myth says that in the 15th century, it's the story of St. Boniface, which is actually from the 8th century. But essentially, what it says at this time is that he had managed to thwart a human sacrifice by cutting down the tree that the person was supposed to be sacrificed on, and a fir tree then grew in its place with the branches then representing Christ's eternal truth. That's like one of the things behind it. It's when it associates with religion. What I'm talking about here, though, are myths and legends. That's not the actual truth behind the Christmas tree, per se. Those are just the stories that have been passed down for a long time. The real origin of Christmas trees do appear to have come out of Germany, though, from the medieval age. So they were pagan. No, not necessarily. It was just part of the they tradition just... that carried forward utilizing trees for a holiday. It wasn't the, it wasn't the, it wasn't use in kind of pagan that moved forward because it was a different concept. So it was German. Yeah, like it was German. So like as an example, there was a guild in the city of Freiburg that put up a tree in 1419 that was decorated with apples, flower paste wafers, tinsel, and gingerbread. And at the same time that they were putting all this on, they were simultaneously putting on paradise plays. And these were performed in order to celebrate the feast day of Adam and Eve, which fell on Christmas Eve. It's actually interesting how much religious holidays have changed over time. But the the tree of knowledge was at this point represented by a evergreen tree with apples tied to its branches. Not oranges. No, because like, you know, the 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 um, like the uh, the the forbidden apple, like the uh, the fruit of knowledge. Oh. That's what it was supposed to be. It's the paradise place and Adam and Eve. So that's, that's where that whole thing came about. And what a number of historians who went back and were researching this found is that they have all these records of this time of trees that were decorated with colored wool thread, straw, apples, nuts, pretzels, just different kinds of food items and other things that would be colorful. Because, you know, they didn't exactly have modern plastics and ceramics and other things that were going to be going on there at that time that would fit the bill. So the oldest tree market, though, is thought to have been located in the German border in Strasbourg in Alsace. Like, you know, Alsace-Lorraine, that border between, uh, between like, uh, France and Germany. So that, which was then part of the, uh, uh, which was then part of the Rhineland, that is where it is in now modern-day France. And they would sell trees specifically to people in this region that had a tradition of decorating Christmas trees with all these different apples and not per se oranges because they couldn't get citrus, but they would get these other colorful fruits and items and set them up. Here's the big problem. And we're going to get into this at a later time. These trees in that area became so incredibly popular that they wiped them out, basically. Christmas trees. Like they're Christmas trees. They cut them down to such a level that they pretty much had to have tree farms, right? But the tree farms, as the centuries went on, couldn't keep up with the demand. And this is where artificial trees came into existence. I know, it's not weird. Interesting fact, though, about Christmas trees. Artificial trees are actually worse for the environment than Christmas tree farm trees because Christmas tree farm trees are specifically planted to be picked. So they're not like just cutting down trees all willy nilly. but some people tend to get the reusable plastic trees and throw them out every year or throw them out before Why? they need to be th- Why would throw them out do before this? they need to be thrown out. So now you have just like plastic everywhere. It's just and also the process of making it 
is not great for the environment either. So honestly, question for you: it's just I one of those things. You, you, so you're saying how it's worse for them, right? What there wasn't there a mathematical thing that someone calculated how long you would have to have a plastic tree for in order for it to be less of an impact. So to people speak. do calculations for those all the time, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into the calculations because it also depends on how true their reports are when it comes to the sustainability of the product in the first place. So there's huh. like life cycle analysis studies that go into producing basically anything. You can do it for cars, trees, clothing, but it depends on how they look at it because there's a lot of factors and also un, like calculable factors that aren't really studied, but they also impact whether something's sustainable or not. So it's a really complex study that has to be done. And again, Most people, people disagree. Most people are not going to do it right. Right. And also place. people disagree on how it's done. Like basically, should something be done through the production or should something be done through the actual dismantling and disposal of the product? Um, it's a whole thing. <laughs> G- Gabby, did you just pull out a whole thing from your from your grad studies there for a lot of the environmental studies? Because that sounded good. Well, yeah, we did go into a life cycle analysis for cars and I did one for clothing. Um, you, it's, it's way more complex than a lot of people give it credit for. Exactly. Plus, there's a lot of modeling and math that has like statistics that has to go into it in order to like make accurate predictions, hmm. so to speak. Interesting. Well, I mean, even back in the day, they knew that things were uh, not necessarily going to be around forever. So remember how I said they were cutting down all the trees? It got so bad that in the mid 1500s, the region of Alsace, what I was talking about there, they had to, and I kid you not, put out an ordinance that allowed one tree per family. Were people cutting a tree for everyone in their family? Literally some people were. Oh my God, If you were wealthy enough and you could afford to do that, you just stick trees everywhere. I'd be like, and Joya gets a tree and Steven gets a tree Mm -hmm. and I get the biggest tree because I'm the most important. Oh, yeah, that's how we're going to stack it up. And each person gets to decorate their own tree and they get to show it off there at the end. And all of Joya's tree will have all of her ornaments on one branch, yes. Oh, yeah. oh my God, because she does. That. That's exactly what our <laughs> daughter does when decorating anything for a tree. Okay, so that's what happened then in Europe, See, which brings us to the question then of, okay, well, how did Christmas trees get popular in the United States? Well, references to Christmas trees, or at least ideas of it, go back into Germanic homes, like those who that were from more like German background in terms of immigration that had been around since really the late 1700s, like we have records. But you didn't start to see more of it until going into the early 1800s, particularly in the regions of like the uh, like the the West, like the Midwest. So from Pennsylvania, heading on over into Ohio, Minnesota, etc, which saw a lot of German immigrants come into that region. And there were even records and stories of in 1805, there's a school for American uh, Indians that were run by missionaries which, you know, there's, that's a whole mixed bag when it comes to history right there. But they have records of students being ordered to go and fetch small trees for Christmas, like these kinds of things. And so similar experiences would pop up, pop up all over the first half of the 19th century. And it would specifically come from these regions that would have large influxes of German immigrants that would then use the American products of whatever they had around them to be able to decorate. Is like, that where the oranges and popcorn and Like down stuff south, that's from? what they would have, yes. The big one, especially because Midwest, popcorn and cotton. A lot of that stuff. Because, you know, big, soft, fluffy, and that's what they would do. But Listen, we're going to get into this when we talk about Christmas lights, because that's one of the things. But I want you to imagine this right now. The spoiler alert for later on in this podcast, do you know how they decorated those things in the beginning? The trees? Yeah, they didn't have modern Christmas lights. Candles. They used candles. Flammable. They put strung up cotton on trees, and then had lit candles surrounding them the entire time. How many fires? I don't know, all right? I'm assuming it was quite a few fires. But then again, who knows? Maybe they were just really, they were using candles all the time. I feel like they wouldn't do that just up, you know. They were, they were. And we're going to get into the stories of how they did this in the first place, but I have to stress that right now. You're talking about in a place that could be dry and arid and using freaking candles and cotton to decorate a tree. Oh, okay. Well, either way, The big point in which it becomes popular, not just for German immigrants, but for everyone, so to speak, it actually becomes popular is because of Queen Victoria. And I know I've made a short about this. I know I've talked about it before, but for anyone who has not heard this, so Queen Victoria, after who the Victorian age is named. And also Victoria 3. Which I also play (laughs) on my gaming channel, yes. 
Uh, she married Prince Albert, who was a German prince. And there is a, not a postcard, like a portrait, some kind of big art piece that essentially they put out in the, like, 1848 that had the royal family gathered around the German Christmas tree that had presents under it. It had decorations. It had all of this. And so you had all these puritanical families in northeastern United States, in New York, in New Jersey, going down into Maryland, et cetera, heading further south. They were part of the old aristocracy of the United States, not necessarily German heritage, but they didn't celebrate those, uh, those beliefs. But then when the queen did it, oh, now that stuff was in fashion. Oh, my gosh. Which meant that all those rich people started doing it. And then once the rich people started doing it, that meant that anyone who could just cut down a tree, which was pretty easy to do, could also start to then imitate them. So the practice then started to spread pretty rapidly all over the United States. It's Thanks like a freaking Queen Victoria. It's like Botox or plastic surgery. I don't like that comparison, but you, I know that you're you right. You know what I mean? Because I know that you're right. When we were kids, the only people who got like Botox and plastic surgery were like celebrities or really rich people. Mm-hmm. And now everybody's like, oh my God, I got like two cc's of this and I got like three in here. And I'm like, I hate that you're right. I hate I'm not judging you, you, if you do that. I'm just like, no, but you it's, know? It's, it's the exact same kind of concept. I totally I'm get that. I'm about to do that too. Cause I got some wrinkles. I totally get that. And then, okay, here's one of the big kickers as well. So that's how Christmas trees got popular. That's the standard stuff. Do you know what the big thing was that really blew my mind going into this research? You know how those, those giant trees, like you go to our city, where we're, where we're close by. Oh, the Rockefeller and, tree. Yeah, like the Rockefeller tree. And they have all those big trees in some of the big cities that are strung up with lights. So as it turns out, the majority of those trees, they were put up specifically during the Great Depression. Like that's when a lot of those traditions started because it takes a lot of work to get one of those trees prepared. So that was usually something that was done almost as a kind of charity to show off the modern era and simultaneously give people work to do during the holidays. I thought it was going to be something sweet, like all of the wealthy people bought gifts and put them under the tree. But for they the... did that too. But I'm talking about the act of putting up the tree. They okay. usually set a charity around them. Hmm. So that is where they did that. And, and of course, um, one of the big trees like in the Rockefeller Center, it had 2,500 lights that were attached to it. And it was specifically sponsored by the electric company there in order to show off the modern era. So they did that because, you know, they provided all the light bulbs. They're like free electricity. <laughs> and then, of course, over time, the trees start to change. Uh, we see less and less and less live trees and the majority of them then become fake trees. And in 1964, in December, Time magazine would herald the new Christmas tree trend that was sweeping the nation. Fake ones. Plastic trees. But it wasn't even plastic at first. I kid you not, the first trees, this is what we're talking about. It happened first in Europe. They were goose feather trees. I want you to imagine they're sticks of metal, right? And then out of the metal, they've taken goose feathers. They have split them in half, dipped them in green paint, and have them glued all over the tree, the, the, the tree, the frame, in order to create a tree. I don't love that. <laughs> I don't I, love if, that. Seriously, right now, I, and I, we probably put this on Patreon, look up goose feather tree 1800s. It, it looks like the saddest version of the Charlie Brown Christmas special tree that you could ever imagine. And then following this, they had um, other variants of trees, like the aluminum trees, the metal ones. And then later on, going into the 60s and 70s, plastic trees really became a thing. And they got better and better and better with time. To the point that out of the hundred odd million households in the U.S. that have a tree or so, on average, 82% of them are fake now and only 18% are real. Because I get that though, because you got to go get the real tree. You got to bring it into your house. It's going to be shedding everywhere. You're going to decorate it. It's going to die. If you're anything like me, you don't want to take down your Christmas tree right after Christmas. Okay. We're pushing February. Like it's almost a Valentine's day tree at that point. The tree's going to be dead in your living room. No, it's true. It's true. It's what happens for most people. It's just easier. Because we put ours up like ridiculously early, like day after Halloween and we take it down like, Valentine's Day. Next year, I might just throw some like hearts up there. Call it a year. We've had a Christmas tree that has been sitting up on an upper level of our house (laughs) for the last three years. We put it up the first year that we moved in and we left it there. (laughs) Because, you know, like in homes, in your entryway, you usually have that giant window with the chandelier. So we have one of those. And then the platform from the second story where you would put a tree so that people from outside can see the tree. We put it up there. Completely not thinking about taking it down. 
Um, <laughs> and then we looked at it after Christmas and we were like, absolutely uh, not. No, I don't feel like, like doing it. Unless you walk in and you're specifically looking up. You're not going to see it anyway. It's fine. <laughs> and that brings us then to Christmas lights. So, okay. Christmas lights. Now, if we talk about Christmas trees, Christmas lights are something that go back, I mean, older than what I had anticipated. Because remember, we, I just mentioned the whole candle thing. I know, but I'm assuming that people, it is so depressing in winter. It I is. mean, it is dark at like 4 p.m. Nobody is having a good time unless you love darkness, which good for you. But I, I personally. I want to make a joke really badly right now. I do like, you want to live? <laughs> I like darkness. Take that but, what you will. But I'm assuming they would put up the lights in order to um, make it slightly less depressing. Oh, like, yeah, it's one of the big oh, things. Oh, look, it's pretty and it's dark, but there's something pretty. Why do you think there's so many holidays that occur during winter time? Like post harvest, post everything. The amount of times that people will be trying to break up the tedium of winter with like feasts and holidays and other kinds of things. And other things that cause them to be lots and lots of November birthdays. <laughs> Oh, my God. yeah, 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 that, that is that there's a reason why the majority of people end up being born in the fall. <laughs> also, it's kind of boring in winter. What else are you going to do? You're going to find somebody and be like, let's cuddle. <laughs> I mean, what else is there to do? <laughs> it's cold. So, yes. Now, Christmas lights are something that can help with all that. And every single year, people unpack their lights and they start setting it up in all kinds of varying different designs. You have all these modern creations that we see nowadays of like the actual like figures, like what we have outside with the reindeer, so to speak. Somebody turned their house into a gingerbread house. Yeah. there's Using all like a bajillion lights. It's some really cool stuff. There's that firefighter, uh, like the firehouse nearby us that syncs all of it up to music and it's really cool. Lots of cities have zoos and parks that you can pay to just drive through and look at lights. Yeah, it's a really big thing. And that is something that for years has been the case where people just try to get the stuff for like holiday cheer to be able to see stuff. And that's probably the most crucial aspect about this in the first place, to see stuff. We would wonder in the beginning, it's like, okay, you have a tree, you have it decorated. Why the hell do you have lights all around it in the first place? Well, the actual origin of lights, like the first thing that they would have been using is candles. And they didn't have the candles on there to provide, you know, a yellow flame. That wasn't anything like that to provide color. They had candles specifically in order to provide light because that's what candles were for. That's what you use them for. You no, need to be able to see things. No, they use them for warmth. Sometimes you would. I mean, you don't know. I'm not going to say otherwise. They technically are a fire, so it would warm you up. So you could. You could. It's true. But yeah, these candles, they would initially attach to the tree using like wax or pins or other kind of stuff. And then from there, the candles all across the tree would then illuminate all the varying different decorations that you would have whether those are other figurines that you have on there, the apples, like all the stuff. Because the cotton. The cotton. It, listen, if you get a fruit and you get a shiny, brand new, like red fruit, a flame on it is going to make it even look glossier, right? It's going to shine a little bit more. That's, oh my gosh, is that why there's bulbs and the bulbs are red and green and golden? Sort of, sort of, yes. See, I, I love how you're connecting that because that is part of the truth of it for what they did. Though the actual origin behind the companies that created that, I put that whole thing in here too, and it's freaking hilarious. Oh my gosh. Um, especially when you look at the initial cost of how much some of the stuff was in the first place. It, people think that Christmas lights are expensive now. Holy crap. Okay, so again, the original purpose of all this stuff for candles was to bring illumination to the ornaments that were, adorn uh, that were adorning the tree, of course. And this practice would continue until, you know, going into the 1900s when electricity ended up becoming more common later on. But prior to that, instead of just pins and wax, which I want to say this again, okay, cotton that is on the tree, how is this flame being held to the tree? By being pinned with wax. What does wax do when it gets hot, when it's near a fire? Melt. It melts. Well, they probably knew what they were doing. They were just making sure that it wasn't near any other flames. That would melt the wax. That would cause the candle to fall. That would cause the tree to go up in flames. You know, I'm sure they knew what they were doing. How many candles do you think people would potentially go through having to just try to maintain it? Because you wouldn't do that stuff for Christmas season. I'm pretty sure they would only light it for the holiday itself. Like the day of. Like the day of. There's no way you could maintain that through the I whole thing. I feel like Christmas season didn't really become a season until they could commercialize it. Yeah, that's true. my personal opinion, thought. I have no basis in fact because I haven't looked into it yet. No, no, I think you're probably right. That's, that's going into a lot of this. But anyway, talking about the actual ornaments and lights and everything that we want to tree, 
glass ornaments were used to provide some kind of decoration for trees since at least the 1500s. And the interest in decorating Christmas trees with ornaments really came popular in America, as I said, when Queen Victoria did her little thing with her husband. And from then on, it became really popular across the United States. And this marked a big shift in how people would begin to decorate things because by this time, more people have more money, technology is getting better, and it soon moves from simple candles to straight up putting lanterns on them. Like, the lanterns are at least protected, you know? So it's a candle still. It's still like a candle or a wick that's in there. But at least it has a glass case. Small lanterns? Yes, they would. Okay. It would be like those. Some of them would even be like the little, uh, not, not even like lanterns, but you know those dias that you talk about with the Diwali? There'd yeah. be even things that potentially would be like that. But it would also vary. They would usually want to put something in a glass case to kind of protect it because open flames are not fun when around flammable objects. Typically. Typically they're not. Anyway, soon after this, electricity really starts coming into the scene and beginning to light up these trees. In 1882, there was this huge event in New York when the first Christmas tree illuminated by electric lights was introduced. So Edward Johnson, who was a friend of the famous inventor Thomas Edison, though we could probably tell an entire story about that guy and how much of an ass he was and what he did for stealing many people's stuff, but he was the individual that was responsible for putting on this display. The Christmas tree was lit with a beautiful hand-wired array of red, white, and blue lights. Because, you know, like, like the United States and everything. And the USA, reflection of the colors. USA. I was going to make like a bald eagle scream if you guys could see that on my face, but I couldn't, I can't pull that off. <laughs> so this is a huge event that would have been like, it was the first major electric light display of a tree in the United States. And the same kind of Christmas lights, the red, blue, and white ones, these would become available for sale around 1890. And from there, People everywhere started to use them when they could, especially if they could afford it. Like the White House saw its first electrically lit Christmas tree in 1895 when it was lit up by Cleveland, uh, by Cleveland, like President Cleveland's his first lady, his wife, Frances Cleveland. She thought that Christmas lights were, quote, technically savvy. Technologically te- 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 savvy. Te- technologically savvy. She thought they were real swell, so to speak. <laughs> but here's where it gets into cost. Because you all think, yeah, when you think of like a big string of lights, you have a pack of like, well, we have the ones that are behind us right now. I know that I have these things. It's like 200 bulbs in there for one of these sets. And I think, or 300. 300 bulbs. That should be on our house. It should be. They're not. You know, I'm going to set them up after this. Screw no, it. No, yes, we're I not. Am. Yes, I am. It's cold. It's literally snowing. Yeah, that makes it more special. It's Christmas. Anyway, though that set costs like what, 20 bucks? For that year? I feel like it was cheaper than 20 bucks. Yeah, 20 well, bucks? Yeah, or maybe like 15. I think it was, oh, oh no, it was, uh, it was, I think it was, you buy three and you got a discount. That's why we got three in the first place. It's like 10 bucks. Maybe that's what it was. I'm just confusing. At Lowe's. Either way. Oh, no, they're on sale from 40. Ah, see, see, see. Okay, so that's one of the things is here. I probably sent, spent like 50 bucks on those lights. That was for three sets of lights with 300 a piece. When you bought one of these back in the day, a set of 24 lights would cost $12. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but then you got to remember that this is back. The bulbs were massive, weren't they? Yeah. Well, they also couldn't reduce them to the same degree here. They wouldn't last nearly as long. And this was $12 in like the early 1900s. So, you know how big we're talking here? We're talking like a single pack of 24 bulbs costing 80 bucks today. We have 300 for like, for like 20. It's a very big difference, right? So that is a lot, which means that the electric companies had this very brilliant idea. The same thing that people do nowadays when they have something that, you know, they really want to do, but it's way too expensive. Are you looking at me because of the Peloton? No, I'm not looking at you because of the Peloton. I'm thinking about what people have to do because I can't afford to buy just like a massive, massive shop back every time I have to do something to clean something. <laughs> oh my God. They rent it. Gabby, they rented Christmas lights. That's reasonable. It was 80 bucks for 12 12, or 24. 24, yeah. Yeah. That's that's rent worthy. So this was a business model where General Electric produced the first sets of Christmas light for rent in 1903. And they put them out so that people would actually be able to, you know, get them. And these lights came in seven different colors. You had clear, 
frosted, green, blue, purple, ruby, and opal. And that's, that's what they use for this. That's really smart because like if they're using it just for one day, you rent, everybody's renting these lights for just one day. General Electric is probably making bank. Oh yeah, they probably do. Especially, I, I only can imagine though about what the cost would be if you actually broke one. Because uh, that would hurt. That would hurt. Now, not everyone, of course, was into all of these. It wasn't it, just because it's the new technology doesn't mean that it's inherently a good thing. And there was um, there was a number of frequent fires, as you could probably imagine, that was caused by early electrical systems and how poor they were. So there was this guy then called Albert Sadaka, who, de- who developed safer lights that reduced the risk of fires that were caused by Christmas light strings, which was a pretty common thing that could happen, by the way. And he and his family owned a novelty lighting company. And in 1917, Albert, at the time he was only a teenager, suggested that the store offered brightly colored strands of Christmas lights to the public. And by the 1920s, Albert and his brothers organized the, quote, National Outfit Manufacturers Association, or NOMA, a trade association. That soon became the NOMA Electric Company, with its members cornering the Christmas light market until the 1960s, because basically the only ones that were producing these damn things in the first place, because no one else seemed to be able to make them in a manner that was actually safe and good. (laughs) So they pretty much controlled everything. That tradition of outdoor light display that they would put out didn't just extend to strings, though. It also went in for, I mean, the things that we have on our front lawn, like the stuff with, uh, like with, you know, reindeer, with your fake snowmen, with your icicles, all these kinds of things. All of those became increasingly popular to create going over the course of the 40s, especially, but they really started in the 30s with the novelty items because, you know, they would try to do things and create stuff for the holidays. And then wasn't there a depression? Yes. They still tried to find different ways for holidays to give people work to do and set stuff up because it was a thing to do, almost in the way like people would build roads. And then it got really popular after World War II because now, of course, everyone has money again, which means they have money to spend on things and everyone is getting electricity. So that, to this day, now leads us to our modern day lights, which are still continuing. That's the origin of Christmas lights. Next after that, Santa Claus. So the big man himself in red who delivers, I don't even know where it is that I'm going with Santa to begin Claus. this. Yeah, it's Santa Claus. You all know exactly what I'm talking about here in the first place. So for a lot of children that are living in the United States or really wherever it is that you are that may possibly celebrate Christmas like this in the first and place. And not Krampus. And not Krampus. Oh my God. I, I thought about including that in here, but that is also everyone's fun fact that they love to bring up about weird holiday traditions is to talk about Krampus. So I, I was like, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't do that one in here already. So Santa Claus is one of those things that is a key part pretty much every modern Christmas. We're all aware of this. But how the hell does Santa Claus even come into existence in the first place? Fever dream. Too much meth. LSD. Shrooms? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, basically everything that you possibly listed and more. Because, I mean, (laughs) look, whether or not you believe in Santa Claus. What do you mean whether or not? You believe in Santa Claus? I'm saying that we're not talking on behalf of children everywhere. I, okay, I'm just saying if your kid is listening to this podcast, why, why? Like, if your kid still believes in Santa Claus and is listening to the podcast, I have a lot of questions. Look, the gist of it is that the whole tradition for Santa Claus, at least as we associate it with the United States, can be traced back to. Dutch colonization, right? Because you had Dutch immigrants and Dutch tradition because when they settled in what is now New York in the 17th century, they brought with them the legend of Sinterklaas. Like Sinterklaas is probably the closest association that we have immediately of the idea of what would become Santa Claus. And that is because this is the individual that would come in and leave presents for children on the eve of December 6th. Not like Christmas Day, it's just that's what you would do on December 6th. And from there on, 19th century literary works, all the stuff from like Night Before Christmas, a mid 20th century Coca-Cola ad campaign, all this kind of stuff that ended up being created just propelled this idea of this old thing of Santa Claus forward and really gave us the modern Santa Claus that we have now. Which is going to bring up then a very important question, like what the hell actually is Santa Claus? What exactly am I talking about in the first place? Also, when did everyone commit to just saying is Santa Claus is real? Like when did everyone decide, hey, we have to lie to our children so they can be happy? The 1950s 
and 60s, pretty much. It's post-World War II. Yeah, literally, I'm not even kidding. Like the whole thing that it puts out with the Coca-Cola ad and whatnot. If you look up the old Coca-Cola ads from like the 50s and 60s, you'll, you'll know exactly what it is that I'm talking about for their Christmas ones. So the, the individual that we would call Sinterklaas is a guy of the older variety, I would say, who dressed up as a bishop and would bring Dutch children gifts in early December. And he is based on the idea of St. Nicholas of Mira, right? We, we all know the story of St. Nick, or I should say that we all know the legend of the idea of Santa Claus being associated with the Catholic Saint, Church. Yeah, the Catholic Church and St. Nicholas. It is the Catholic Church, right? Well, yes, that's the origin for this here. So he is based on St. Nicholas of Mira, as I said, who, according to Christ, Christian tradition, was a bishop in the small Roman town of Mira during the fourth century. And his reputation for generosity and kindness gave rise to legends of all different kinds of miracles where according to one story, he brought back to life like three children through the power of prayer who'd been chopped up by a butcher and then put in barrels. Because he was going to sell them and pass it off as meat. Yeah. <sighs> yep. Then another story describes how young Nicholas secretly provided marriage dowries by dropping gold in the chimneys of girls who did not have the money to be able to pay the dowry for their wedding, which on one hand is like really nice. And then on the other hand, you're like, damn, back in the day, you couldn't get married because you just didn't have that cash. <laughs> Dowries are a very interesting concept in history, I have to say. Understandable in, in many circumstances for how they would work, but it's... I only like the one where you'd have to pay to marry me. Well, there's that idea. So, so there's the whole thing of like a bride price that would have to be paid, but a dowry is also something that would have to be provided by... In my, in my culture, we do dowry. Well, not mine, specific, but Hindu culture, there is dowries. There are dowries. If, if I can clarify to ask, the way that it kind of works from that is that... I wouldn't know. Oh. I was an Indian married. It's true. It's true. I mean, I, I, I don't think that I fit the part. For anyone who doesn't actually physically see my face right now, I don't think that I fit the part necessarily You can well. still have the wedding, though, because, um, like, a lot of my friends would get, like, married in the U.S. and then they'd go back home and have their wedding. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it's, 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 here's, here's a real dark part about all this, because we're talking about weddings and everything. That whole legend with St. Nicholas, the girls that he saved by providing them gold so they could pay for their wedding, basically, for their, for their dowry. They lived uh, happily ever after. Yeah. At the end. If he didn't do that, then what would have happened is that uh, oftentimes the fate for the poor girl. Yeah, the, uh, yeah the, the fate for poor girls who could not actually get married was um, to become prostitutes, basically. Is that real? Yeah, that's a real thing that would happen in history. Yeah, the potential. That there's a real potential of what could happen here. So you'd actually end up having to sell. That's actually really sad. Yeah. Welcome to history. It's never something that's exactly What if the exactly guy so wanted to marry them? So he snuck them money that they can use to pay him. Wink. There's got to be romantic stories like that. There's I'm gonna no write way one. that there's I'm going to write one. Look out for my historical romance novel coming next week. <laughs> <laughs> next week. Damn, that is a fast I used pace. to write fan fiction. I got, I, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> okay. So all of these stories that we're talking about with St. Nicholas, though, these would grow over the course of the second millennium, like after the year 1000. And this would mix with a bunch of other traditions like the St. Nicholas of Sion, so that he became a legendary figure that we now associate as Santa Claus. But during the 20th century, a number of historians that were looking back on this and the origin behind all this, because remember, we're talking about the Catholic Church and saints and the history can get a little bit murky, especially with what could have been approved by the church at different points. I say this is someone who was raised Catholic. It's a, it's a very real reality of all this. We have to understand this with a historical legitimacy that there have been many uh, accusations that St. Nicholas was never actually a real person in the first place. We don't really know. Like, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding his existence, and this is reflected in the revised entries on Nicholas in the Books of Saints, where several historians maintain that St. Nicholas had lived and performed many acts of kindness and generosity, but others argue that the lack of documentation during his lifetime was, well, not both others, but it's like, these people argue that just because there's no proof that he didn't have any disciples, he didn't have anything that was written anything down, he didn't have any of the stuff, it doesn't mean that he didn't exist. He could have existed. He just couldn't have been as cool as people said he was, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, possibly. And then other people assert that it's like, no, just the mere fact that they had churches that go back during this time here that are like dedicated to him in the early medieval period is enough, even if the stuff that was written about him 
didn't actually get written down for like two or 300 years after. Wait, he had churches? Then yeah, definitely. Well, you why know how would they make a church, a church that would be dedicated to a saint? Yeah, why like, would they make a church dedicated to some guy who wasn't a saint, well, who wasn't the, real? The question from it is that the, the churches that we're talking about didn't really come into existence for like 300 years after. Yeah, but they so, wouldn't just, you can't just start a church for somebody you have no proof of, right? Yeah, but interestingly enough, so there's, there's a church in I here, mean, right? That could be, that, that whole entire phrase needs to be unpacked. Do not unpack it. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but let, check this out. This is what's really weird. And I found this whole thing. And it, this sounds like an interesting mystery, almost one that you could have put in a, in a conspiracy theory. So check this. The 2017 dating to the fourth century of a piece of pelvic bone that is attributed to St. Nicholas, which is now housed in the United States, offers a tantalizing piece of the puzzle. Because interestingly, St. Nicholas's alleged remains at Bari, like the church where his remains were moved to, is missing a part of his pelvic bone. So there's a piece of apparently the saint of St. Nicholas that is in the United States. And it's like this idea like, hmm, what if it is connected? Because we got, a piece, of, we got a piece of pelvic bone and that actual skeleton that is supposed to be him is missing a piece of a pelvic bone. So guys, we spent... This entire Christmas trying to convince Dre that Santa Claus is real because last year she looked me dead in the eye and said Santa Claus can't fit down the chimney, mom. He's not real. And she was three and now she's four. And I'm like, I'm going to sell this. We got her believing. But when she stops believing again, we're going to take her to see this pelvic bone. <laughs> I'd be like, he is real. See? So, yeah, that's the whole thing with Santa Claus is like it's based on St. Nicholas, but then it's like a combination between multiple characters. And then there's debate between historians as to whether or not it's even real in the first place, like if there ever was a saint. And it's just, yes, welcome. Welcome to history. Nothing is literally set in stone. She Except is, for the tombs. Unless they get moved after three days. It's like a rolling stone, like the big stone that gets moved because... All right, I'm going to shut up now. We're going to probably have an ad. <laughs> okay, now the big thing for Christmas itself, the thing that every kid absolutely loves more than Santa Claus himself because it's the thing that they're actually wanting from Santa Claus in the first place. Presents. Presents. Do you think kids would like Santa Claus if he didn't bring them? No, it'd be kind of strange. No. Because I was at my hairstylist appointment and her four-year-old looks at him and goes, why does Santa keep telling me I'm good? Why does he care? And I was like, he has a point. He has a point. Yeah, it's fair enough. So here's the thing with Christmas presents, right? It's not a recent concept. A lot of people think that Christmas presents are something that only really came about into existence because of the commercialization of Christmas. But it's No, they not. just commercialized what was already there. That's always what happens. It's true. It's true. No, she's right. She's 100% right. It's just, you know, you get people on the internet that just want to disavow things entirely because they will say it's one or the other. That's but it, it started off pretty wholesome, didn't it? It really did. And it's only in recent times that it got as extensive as it did. I remember there's a study. I didn't even put it in here. But when I was doing the research here on Christmas presents, there was a study that found that the amount that people are spending on presents and the amount that are being given out has grown drastically. So I think by the year 2020, it was the average person was buying 14.8 presents for 8.6 people. Because it was measuring how many presents they were buying versus how many people they were giving it to. And that's the average. So that's quite a bit because it used to be back in the day, you basically got, gave like a small gift to your partner and children. When I was growing up, we got, we didn't have like lists. You didn't make a list of what you wanted for Christmas. It was a complete surprise. No expectations. They could have gotten us like the same thing. I would have been like, oh my God. And it was so magical because you just wake up, presents. And then you didn't know what, what it was. Literally, Everything was surprised. It was literally so cool. It almost makes it sound like for you, Gabby, that Christmas growing up was like, uh, like what happens with Joy when she gets one of those mystery box things she gets to open up for a <laughs> surprise pet inside. <laughs> like one of those Hatchimal eggs or whatever they're called. Oh, uh, yeah, like that. So people have been giving out presents for a very long time, even though, of course, the trends and what they're exactly doing with those presents and how much they're spending, et cetera. That is something that has changed all over the world for how much they're doing. It is still something that the festive period during winter, or at least during this time period, is something that hasn't really changed all that much. Because today, of course, giving presents is a crucial part of Christmas. That's like one of the really, that's the, one of the big points. And a lot of families end up dedicating a lot more time, energy, and resources probably than they should. To be fair, that's one of the things, especially that has happened with modern commercialization. 
but it's still something that is a key aspect for children, for adults, for all these. Getting a Christmas present is a huge deal, but why? Well, because it's something that is, we're going to get into that. Okay. We're going to get into that. It's part of the commercialization. But what we're going to need to go back in the first place is explain how Christmas presents aren't something that are new per se. It is something that are much older. The way that Christians would justify before things became less religious when it comes to Christmas is that Christian households used to justify that, oh, the three wise men gave Jesus in the baby in the manger, the three gifts of frankincense, myrrh, and gold, right? Like that's what it is. Therefore, you would be giving gifts to your friends or family or specifically like your children. That's where Christmas would still be about getting toys and other little items and things for children. But the actual idea of giving gifts during this time period that we're talking about goes back much older. And when I say older, we're talking about to Rome, like Roman times. So have you, have you heard of a, a holiday or I say holiday, a festival called uh, Saturnalia? I've heard of it. Okay. So this, for those who are unfamiliar, you have like the god Zeus and everything within like Greek lore. So the Greek, uh, the, the Roman equivalent of that is Saturn, right? That's, that's who would be in charge there. That's where a lot of the names for the planets come from. Just a little tidbit for anyone who's curious. And Saturnalia was something that was celebrated between the 17th of December to the 23rd of September. It was a time in which it was celebrated with sacrifice, public banquets, private gift giving, partying, and just a wild atmosphere where it wasn't just about, you know, just being crazy. It was you could be crazy with very little repercussions. It was one of the only times of the year that basically a slave could speak on equal status terms with a person that should have been their master. Like it was a time in which everyone was, I'm not going to say equal because that's, that's a horrible exaggeration to say in the first place, but it was something where people were capable of speaking on more equal terms with one another in such a stratified society than at any other point during the year. It was wholesome, if you will. It was a time of great celebration. And the day in this fest, like in these festivities that we're talking about where gifts were exchanged, was called Sigillaria, and this took place on the 19th of December. What's weird about this, and the way that they did this, is that the value of the gifts were reversed of how we would think about it. So, like, yeah, if we were getting a gift for our daughter, it is our daughter, we love her very much, or for each other, we would probably spend more to get something big and significant, right? To, sh to show that love. Yeah. For them, it was almost the opposite. It was the smaller the item, the more mundane and nice little thing, like a little thing of obviously not chocolate because that didn't exist at this time, but some kind of little gift or treat. That was something that showed respect. And then the more distant you were from someone, the bigger the gift might potentially be. That kind of makes sense, though, because you wouldn't necessarily know what to give to someone and you wouldn't want you, you wouldn't want them to feel like you don't care about the, I, I, it makes sense in my head. No, it does. Here's one of the really big parts about this. There was a, a monetary gift called a, uh, a God, I'm going to push the pronunciation for it. I have it here. A sigillar, sig sigillarium. Sigillarium. Essentially, this was a, a bonus almost that was given to people to be able to pay for these gifts. It's pretty much the equivalent of your boss giving you a holiday bonus to be able to buy this stuff. That's cute. Like that's something that they would do, right? And unlike a lot more of the, uh, the, the, the specific cults and festivities that would occur in different parts of the empire, Saturnalia was everywhere. Usually these religious festivals and cults would be allocated to one specific part of the empire where it was really popular and it might appear in pockets elsewhere. This holiday, though, was everywhere. And it was celebrated at the end of the calendar year. It was a hugely loved festival. Massive carefree atmosphere, generous gift giving, lavish entertainment. It was super fun for people. And that made it pretty hard to get rid of when Rome stopped being pagan. Because with the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity back in the, uh, back in the 4th century AD, like back in the beginning, that was the beginning of the end, arguably, for paganism within the Roman Empire. As it slowly from that point on 
began to convert more and more to Christianity. The problem was, is that when you get rid of a faith, you get rid of its holidays typically too. But you couldn't do that with Saturnalia. Um, it was a bit of a massive problem because people really loved the holiday. So in order to be able to get people to actually celebrate it, they started associating more and more things with it. And from Saturnalia is what then kind of gave us that same December time frame for gift giving. And they were like, oh, no, no, no. It applies to Christianity because he was born yep. on Christmas. So Christian missionaries and preachers would associate these things. And it's one of the most common things. Did they things. just make up his birthday? Oh, no. Jesus was absolutely not born in December. Oh, I know, know that. that. So did they just make up his birthday? I cannot remember off the top of my head if they actually were able to pinpoint the exact date of his birth or the range. I but I'm pretty they, sure they, it was that he was born at some point in spring. I've heard summer, but yeah, it was, it was not Christmas. It was, no, it was not winter. We know for a fact that it was not winter. That's, that much is certain. And so they just took these different things, these different holidays in order to be able to associate and just plan to do things. To be fair, that is one of the reasons why Catholicism was so incredibly successful for like stuff for the Mesoamerica. We talked about what they did with the Native American faiths of their gods and literally building temples dedicated to, or churches dedicated to certain saints that could take over those aspects to make the conversion easier. It is, it, it, it's one of those big things. And so that old pagan custom of gift giving was then rationalized in Christianity by attaching the association of the Magi and giving gifts to Jesus. And over time, that would then evolve as we get St. Nicholas. And from St. Nicholas, we would get Santa Claus. And then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The big thing is, is that as time continued to pass, the spread of Christianity would continue as trade routes be established and new territories would convert to the religions. And this means that way more people were exposed to gift giving and these concepts that were associated. But that wasn't a thing that initially occurred within the United States. See, the funny little detail about all this is that when the first people were coming over, remember what I said, it was German immigrants that brought about the Christmas tree. It was the Dutch immigrants that brought about the idea of Sinterklaas. So the initial people that were coming over, like in the case of, you know, the Puritans and others, they didn't celebrate Christmas, or at least the majority of them did not. This was part of the hardline religious groups, just like what you described it would happen on occasion with your father, where some years they would celebrate, some years they wouldn't. And for the Puritans, they saw this as like Christmas was a holiday influenced by pagan beliefs, and that wasn't truly Christian. So for many of those early colonies, Christmas was banned. It wasn't allowed. It wasn't until all of these things occurred with like Christmas trees and holidays and other immigrants came over that things became more common and popular. And from there, that's when gift giving, giving became more popular. It's one of those really weird things. And so th that's it. God, where do I even go from this? It's just like, that's how it's all connected together. The interesting thing is that when we look at all this, like 70%, what was it, 75? No, I have the statistic. I'm going to pull it up in here right now. 75% of people in New England were of the Puritan faith? Yep. Seven, in 1776, we're talking at the beginning of the United States, 75% of the people in New, New England were of some very, like, variant of the Puritan faith. So they didn't really go and celebrate this thing. But by the 1870s, Christmas was a federal holiday. All these other groups had come across, and that old puritanical idea where it was banned, no longer really a thing. They're like, we got time off. I'm into it. Exactly. And then <laughs> so in the USA in the 20th century, Christmas became this huge phenomenon. The massive increase in wealth that people had for the United States to be able to spend money on things fueled industry after World War II to generate what we would call the Christmas industry. All the stuff from trees to presents, to lights, to everything, people had more money to spend and therefore they bought more. And when they bought more, this meant that it fueled more industry. More industry meant more products for people to buy. And you can kind of see where it goes from then on out. And now we're all traumatized by Christmas shopping. Pretty much. That's exactly what happens. And I'm really, the idea of Santa Claus is the perfect example of this. Everyone loves to bring this up online when talking about commercialization. I know, but the one interesting thing, remember what you were talking about, um, they gave mundane gifts to each other and they gave really lavish gifts to people they didn't know as well. We don't gift each other anything. No, typically. Like, we know each other the best. We don't gift each other anything. We don't, like, exchange gifts. Yeah. 
Also, anything that, that we sense. want for each other, if there was something I wanted through the year, you would either tell me to get it or you would get it for me. And if there was something you wanted, I would get it for you. And but then, then we give gifts to like people who don't live with us. So it's like. Exactly. <laughs> and of course, our daughter, because our oh. daughter is precious and she deserves the world. We're trying to trick her into believing Santa Claus is real. We're right. winning, though. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing to note is that Christmas has become more popular over the years because with history, Christmas is even even with people becoming less and less religious because of the commercialization of Christmas, this has allowed the holiday to last where many others have faded away, even in populations that are not Christian. As an example, in Japan, 1% of the Japanese population is Christian. Yet, Christmas is pretty much a national holiday where everyone celebrates it because it's something that people love the idea of gift giving and of celebrating things with each other, friends, family, etc. So if you go over to Japan, from the time of like November onwards, like when we were there, you saw there was Christmas stuff everywhere. everywhere. He kept walking around like, oh my gosh, your Christmas stuff is already out. And I'm like, Stephen, nobody but you guys celebrate Thanksgiving, okay? The rest of us are holly and jolly around the globe. Like we are paranging. We are out here celebrating. <laughs> and so that's that really it. So despite less than 1% of the population being Christian, it's still a hugely successful thing. And that right there is the commercialization of Christian. Of Christmas. Christmas. You really lost it there, man. Yeah, I know. But you know what commercial thing that really no one wants to buy, but then ultimately does want to buy because it's it's, it's kind of fun, even if it's stupid at the same time? Ugly Christmas sweater Ugly parties. Christmas sweaters. Okay, so I know that this one is going to be quicker off in the first place in comparison to a lot of the other ones that I had significantly more data for. Um, th- th- this one doesn't have as long of a storied history. You know, it's a sweater. It's, 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 How uh, long can this story be? It's fair. Ugly Christmas sweaters. I should have even just thrown this in at the end as a kind of fun fact. I should have just skipped right ahead to eggnog. But the whole gist with Christmas sweaters is we all know how freaking ugly a lot of them are for style. They, they really are. You know, I, I have a nice one. Okay. I have a Hearts of Iron 4 one with tanks on it. And it's a Christmas sweater with tanks. I freaking love this thing. It's great. But for the most of history, Christmas sweaters were not a thing. They didn't really become a thing until the 1950s. And then they were known as, uh, like, I, I, I kid you not, I, I had it in here. Like, they were called jingle bell sweaters because that's what they were. They Did were, they put bells on them? Kind of, some of them. But really, in the early days, these things were not as gaudy as they are now. Like, you know, if you want an ugly Christmas sweater, you can find an ugly Christmas sweater if you want to. But back in the 50s, when they first started rolling these things out, they weren't really popular and they weren't very stylish. I mean, they're not stylish now, to be fair. Yeah, I'm like, but, what are you saying? But what, what I'm saying is, you know how the ones have interesting de- designs, even yeah. if they're not good. The ones back in the day, like if you look up 1950s, 1960s Christmas sweaters, they're super plain. I'm getting you a vintage Christmas sweater. Like they'll, they'll have things that I kid you not are just like some diamonds that go across it. And that's it. Like just red diamonds or something. You know, it, it'll be kind of a plain design of a pullover sweater. That's all it is. But... As time went on and things, things became a little bit more boisterous, the 80s saw a massive surge in ugly Christmas sweaters. And the whole reason they became popular wasn't because of what happened with different fashion trends or anything like that. No, it was because a series of movies and things came out surrounding the holidays, like National Lampoon, or like the, uh, like the, uh, the, 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 the Christmas movie. You know what I'm talking about? with National the, uh, Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, yes, Steve. Yes. So that came out. And in the case of Chevy Chase, he has, there's the scene where he's wearing a really ugly Christmas sweater. And the amount of sales of these Christmas sweaters surged after that movie of people just going out and buying these kinds of things. And you see that over the course of the entirety of the 80s as all these big classic comedy movies and other things come out only to, weirdly enough, basically die out in the 90s. Like that trend pretty much becomes just an 80s thing. It just, it just really dies out until the early 2000s. The first ugly Christmas sweater party then revives the trend because in Vancouver, Canada, not the United States, as I initially thought, because, you know, I thought a lot of the trends that we have here originated here. No, in Vancouver, in Canada, They hold the first ever ugly Christmas sweater party in the early 2000s. And all guests were instructed for this party to wear. I mean, you all know how it works. You wear a freaking ugly sweater. That was the whole point of it. And it was a huge hit. 
Today, the ugly sweater is still something that is a massive, like not only the ugly sweater, but like the ball we're talking about here. It's just a huge festival and event where everyone is going out and partying. And of course, because this was such a big hit and people travel all around for it, people all across the United States also started picking this up. And now every year there are ugly Christmas sweater parties all over the U.S. We were supposed to go to one this weekend. We were. And then not only did we get busy, but our daughter and whole family got sick, which is something that happens in our family a lot. <laughs> what was the origin of um, every single parent being in the trenches of illnesses? Uh, kindergarten and preschool. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the origin of all that here. I'm telling you this right now. Really, there is no rhyme or reason when it comes to a lot of the stuff for ugly Christmas sweaters. They're, the only rule is that there's supposedly a ugly Christmas sweater day that is on supposed to be on like the third Friday of December. That's just made up, right? Yeah, it's yeah. There is really nothing that is backing it because it's not obviously it's like an official holiday. National Donut Day. That's not a real thing. I guys. know. But the really interesting trend is that that started back in the early 2000s. It only got bigger because of stuff with social media, to the point that luxury brands would pick this up and start creating specific luxury variant of ugly Christmas sweaters for these holiday events. I am so over luxury brands. I'm so sorry. It's okay. You don't have to apologize <laughs> for that. Have you seen the advent calendars? And then people are like, oh my God, it wasn't worth it. Like, ma'am, you paid $800 for guesswork. You deserve Bruh, it. I know. I know. It's like the equivalent. You basically gamble at a slot machine for jewelry, of which you're probably not going to like 90% of the pieces. It's not jewelry, though. Like, Wait, what? some people, I forgot which calendar, and it was a few years ago, they got like, you know when you go to Sephora and they give you like sample perfumes and stuff? They got... And then one really insulting one was like a little like carry like pouch. They got a pouch that you could buy for like way less. And it was so expensive, the calendar. But when you tally the stuff you got in it, it was like, way less it's so i don't know I it's so it. funny <laughs> i think it's funny because like if you're gonna spend money like 800 dollars on something just buy the product just buy the they're not gonna stuff that product in there you know no that's fair that's that that's fair and so yeah this is a short section this is absolutely a short section and it lets me move on to the thing that i was really excited about from the very beginning the thing that made me go okay i'm not going to do my original idea and i'm instead going to go down this massive list because this story is freaking hilarious the one you've all been waiting for and i hope you didn't just skip to this eggnog so first off make sure you vote in yes the, you know just vote <laughs> absolutely so first off eggnog what is eggnog eggnog for anyone who is uh unaware of what this is but for anyone with taste <laughs> if you have not been cursed <laughs> to have tasted this yet eggnog is a drink that is traditionally consumed during the winter holiday season this chilled dairy beverage gets its name from one of its main ingredients eggs of course I'm sorry. I'm such an egg hater as well. Ah. And so while many people may not fancy drinking eggs, because, you know, <laughs> it's not something that you want to drink, for a number of people who actually enjoy this, adding milk, cream, sugar, some cinnamon and other stuff, oh, they go wild for it. Some people love eggnog. And so eggnog has been a traditional Christmas beverage for hundreds of years in America, but we are not the only country that has it. And there are variants all over the world of this exact kind of thing. Like, I, I kid you not, there are, there are examples in Italy, in Colombia, uh, Jamaica has its own specialty one as well. There's a variety of these different things. And so eggnog, as you could probably imagine, is a little bit of a uh, controversial beverage. <laughs> you either like it or you hate it. There really isn't an in-between because, you know, some people love it. And then others are going to wonder, why the hell would you put raw eggs in a drink with milk and alcohol? Because that's, that's what it is. But eggnog does really have a long history. It's got a long story behind it. The etymology of the word is fascinating because you have egg. Of course, that's, that's not the fascinating part, I, I promise. Uh, but the whole nog aspect, either is something that meant to it is a strong beer or a wooden cup. And so it seems to combine the meaning of egg with a really strong alcohol. <laughs> and that's, that's like what the name of it is. So no one really knows then who invented the first eggnog, but most historians that cover this kind of concept who look at food history generally agree that eggnog as we understand it came to exist in Britain and that back in the medieval period, there was an older variant called posset in which you had alcohol with figs and eggs that was essentially an 
you know, it's like an aromatic eggnog. And that wealthy people used to use this for drinking during holidays because they were the only ones who could afford it because getting fresh eggs at any time period, unless you were a farmer who owned your own plot of land, that was something that was going to be way more costly. I mean, we already covered that when we did the patron exclusive episode on milk and how valuable that was for people. So interestingly enough, and I, I love this fact that I found this, our founding father himself of the United States, George Washington, freaking loved eggnog. He loved it. That checks it. out. Don't so, ask me how. So he had Just his does. own recipe, right? I want you to hear this. Anyone who's watching this, if you all try this, <laughs> let me know in the comment section below. If you make this and you try it, I want to hear how this is because I'm not going to do it. One quart of cream, one quart of milk, 12 tablespoons of sugar, one pint of brandy, half a pint of rye whiskey, half a pint of Jamaican rum, and a quarter of a pint of sherry. Okay, I want to try it. We're making it. Now, the funny thing is, he doesn't specify at all how many eggs are supposed to go in this One thing. One egg, half an egg, no egg. <laughs> but the generally accepted term when you're making a George Washington eggnog is a dozen eggs. You know, with to that much with alcohol in there, you won't even yeah. notice. The final instructions included in the recipe were to leave in a cool place for a few days and to taste frequently. But due to the fact that this was at a time where refrigeration wasn't a freaking thing, the only time that anyone could actually go and make eggnog was during winter when it was cold outside and you could actually leave a drink outside and it not immediately go bad after like a an hour. Drink with eggs, dairy, and <laughs> rum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I kind of want to try it. We're making it at your mom's house. We're going to make a video <laughs> at his mom's house. We're going to make traditional George, George Washington, Washington eggnog. eggnog. And it's going to be a short or something, but we're doing it. So sorry. And then you're going to try it. I will not try it. I feel like that could be a short YouTube video. We could, we could probably make a little one of that here, the actual process of making it. It needs maybe. to happen. because And then we're going to leave it out and you're going to be like. I need to reach out to, what was it? Tasting history with Max Miller. He <laughs> <laughs> has these suggestions. So eggnog, though, it, though it's very popular, it simultaneously has um, a little bit of a spicy history with it as well as eggnog seems to have been one of the things that was responsible for a straight-up riot occurring at West Point. So I'm sure that a lot of you are, are probably aware of that name here. West Point is the military academy for the Army within the United States, right? And unlike the modern day and age, where it has a very powerful and strong tradition and a very good... Um, God, what's the proper term? I'm fumbling for words at this point. Not representation. It has a... It's got, a, it's got a healthy image. It's got a good image as like something that is... A reputation? Oh, yes. It, that's what I was trying to think of. It has a good reputation. Um, <laughs> a healthy image. Yeah, back in the day, not like at all. So get this. Before the new superintendent came into power, a guy called Thayer. So before he became superintendent in 1817, West Point was barely anything like what we would associate it today in its modern times. Because when it first opened back in 1802, it was nothing more than just a couple of buildings with 10 cadets that were being taught by three teachers. Students were admitted at any point during the year. There was no semester, so to speak. You just kind of signed up and went there in the first place if you got accepted. To West Point? Yes. And admission standards? There basically were none. Pretty much anyone could get in there if you had any kind of real connection. And this all began to change after the War of 1812 because... um. Go figure, you actually need competent military officers in order to be able to fight a freaking war. What? Yeah. Amazing. I mean, weren't people like buying military positions in other countries at this time? Like they, they were fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were fine. <laughs> so Congress then goes and gets this guy Thayer installed as superintendent, hoping that he's going to be able to redirect how things work there. And he is, this is a person who'd become known as the father of West Point. He would revolution, revolutionize the academy instructing each and every member with very strict rules about how they were supposed to maintain themselves. As an example, they were not supposed to leave campus. They could not cook in their dorms. And most importantly of all, they weren't allowed to duel each other. Like with swords? With swords and pistols. Yeah. Because they, imagine putting the years of training into a guy only for him to shoot his other officer in a dispute. Yeah, that was a big At problem. least he's using his training. The other big thing that really did piss people off was no alcohol. At all? Like you couldn't have anything that was at, at the academy. Is you that could, still a rule? I don't know, actually. That's a great actually, thing that I should probably be, look up. Because I think a few years ago, I'm pretty sure it was West Point, a few years ago, a bunch of um, 
students OD and it wasn't on alcohol. It was on other stuff. Ugh. But I'm pretty sure that was a thing that happened. Yeah, potentially. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But at this time, you, you couldn't have alcohol on there because they were horrible with it in the first place. There was an event, the riot that we're talking about, that resulted in potentially one third of the entire academy could have been expelled. For alcohol? Yes. It Here's was that thing. bad. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I just feel like, are you really raising military officers if you aren't raising them with alcohol? Because what is the military runoff? You know? Uh, nowadays, it's um, uh, monster energy and bang and cigarettes, basically. Vapes. It's vapes now. Uh, yeah. Cigarettes. What is this? The 80s? Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. 60s? I don't know. When did people smoke at that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so eggnog was a traditional part of West Point's annual Christmas celebration. But Thayer's restriction on alcohol, not being allowed to have any of this, that's going to throw a serious wrench into the festivities, right? A virgin eggnog. So just egg. Just literally just Egg. Oh, egg with grape <laughs> juice. <laughs> oh, that sounds awful. Uh, no, egg in one of those really shitty O'Doul's beers where it's the non-alcoholic beer. Uh, anyway, not wanting to be denied, you know, a night of revelry and actually having fun, some cadets decided that if alcohol was going to be forbidden, what we're going to do instead is we're going to freaking sneak it in there. We're going to smuggle it. And one of these cadets was, I kid you not, Jefferson Davis, the guy who would become the future president of the Confederacy back during the American Civil War. He was one of the cadets there during this time. And he had a very bad history with alcohol. Like, oh, God, when I was doing the research on this, I was shocked. I did not know this. He was a member of the class of 1828, and he was the first student to be arrested for going to Benny Haven, which is one of two taverns that were located near West Point and the only one which allowed students to barter for alcohol because they could literally trade their blankets and other stuff for alcohol because they didn't have the money otherwise. So they could trade supplies for, for booze. So Thayer's ban on alcohol didn't extend past the boundaries of the academy. It was only within the academy itself. So these varying different taverns and other locations around the, around the territory, they wanted to go ahead and get this stuff. But the problem was is that Benny Haven ended up being too expensive to supply the amount of alcohol that they needed. So instead, several nights before Christmas, what happened is that a number of cadets crossed the Hudson River in like little boats. They went to the East Bank to procure whiskey from another tavern, and then they got a little bit drunk there. So they, they got their supply, right? And then they proceeded to get drunk on their own supply. <laughs> and transport the alcohol back to campus while they were drunk. And at the dock, when they were going to land, they found a soldier waiting for him there. This was one of the first guards that was put on, uh, on duty there in order to try and block any students from doing precisely that. But they managed to bribe him with 35 cents, which, I mean, is, it's not a lot. I mean, even back in the day, that wasn't necessarily a ton, but, you know, it was enough for him to look the other way. And then they then stored the alcohol uh, among their varying different possessions. This was a total of three to four gallons of whiskey. Gallons. So now Thayer may have been a person who was strict, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that the students were going to be trying something. And he knew that cadets had smuggled alcohol before into the academy. So he assumed that with the holidays coming up, they were going to do precisely this. And so he got several people together who are going to be able to stand guard as precaution. He assigned two officers, Captain Ethan Allen Hitchcock and Lieutenant William A. Thornton to monitor the North Barracks. And so when Thornton and Hitchcock went to bed around midnight, nothing was going on. No one was doing anything. It seemed fine. But then four hours later, at 4 a.m. in the morning, Hitchcock awoke to the sound of rowdy boys a few floors above him. And so going up to this floor, he crashed the party and found six or seven cadets that were very visibly drunk. He then ordered them to disperse and to go back to their rooms, and he turned to leave. But before he could go back to his own room, he heard more partying coming from another room. So he went to that one. And when he went in there, he found two cadets that were drunk and attempting to hide under a blanket. 
<laughs> and a third guy that was trying to use a hat in order to cover his face so that he couldn't be seen. They did nothing wrong for you, the officer. So yeah, that guy is straight up trying to hide his, his face with a freaking hat, right? And the whole time, oh, the whole time, the officer is like, please show me your face. No, show me your face. No, show me your damn face. And I kid you not, this exchange goes on between them for like a couple minutes, right? And it turns into a shouting match, which apparently the turns, as the guy turns to leave, apparently someone calls out that they're going to knife him. Hitchcock? But yeah, yeah, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. So as they're going out, what he says, what this officer says is that he is going to go and get the commander, like the commandant. But someone mishears him and thinks that he is going to get the artillerymen for backup. Not like to actually bombard the place, but the artillerymen. And there was a huge rivalry, apparently, that was going on between like the West Point officers and the artillerymen, which then ended up causing a whole bunch of drunken cadets to start to break every single thing in there, barricading as much as they could, tipping shit over, breaking all the porcelain china, like anything everywhere is just getting smashed. Until finally, the commander shows up, looks around and goes, what the f*** is happening? And when he shows up, everything stops. Because after several hours and all that, all that whiskey, the cadets finally begin to sober up and realize what the hell they actually did. Did they get expelled? A whole bunch of them did. So now here's the problem. If uh, over 90 people, I think, were involved in this riot that happened here, the big problem was that they couldn't get rid of a third of the class of their cadets. That would be a huge issue. Not to mention, the entire thing would be a massive stain upon West Point. So it was 90 career. out of 260 cadets? 90 out of 260. Literally a third of the entire thing. So what they ended up doing instead is that only 19 or 20 of those cadets ended up being expelled. The ones who were responsible for the worst of, of it. Ironically from this, remember how we talked about, um, about Jefferson Davis? Yeah. So him and Robert E. Lee were both there at this time. They don't get expelled. Jefferson was one of the first people that ends up getting encountered because he is drunk off his ass. And when he is ordered to go back to his room, he just does. He literally <laughs> just goes back to his room and passes out. So when he wakes up, he is one of the few, thankfully, because there was so much destruction that he does not get court-martialed. Smart, <laughs> hey, I no. think. And that is the story of eggnog at West Point I and how like it led to a freaking riot. The story of just not banning alcohol, For when Christmas. does it work? When does it work? People will be people. Oh, so yes, I think that that is arguably an amazing point to go ahead and end things on here. I just, I, I, I had to save that story for last because it's so stupid. It's so entertaining. And I didn't, I didn't know about this. I didn't. What I, until I did like the research going into all this here, I did not know that story whatsoever. And it is I hilarious. knew about it before this because while I was also writing my podcast episode, he was just like, oh my God, Gabby. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Listen, I get all excited about sharing some of this <laughs> stuff when I get it. All right. It's what happens. Anyway, my friends, thank you very much for listening to us here today. I hope you all have a good holiday, regardless of what it is that you celebrate or even if you celebrate anything at all. I figured that this would be a fun little thing for everyone to do. And I hope that for anyone that may be potentially wrapping any gifts, that this is something that might be a pleasant thing for you to be able to listen to while you scramble last minute to try to put stuff together that you should have done several weeks ago. I don't blame you. We did ours last night. Goodbye, my friends. Merry Christmas. <laughs>